So I want to thank uh, Monica and Denise and Alicia, all who have been uh, amazingly organized and efficient. And thank you, Monica, for the vision for this wonderful, uh, to bring together this wonderful group of people. Um, nothing dates more quickly than projections of the future. Although these architectural visions of the future were created over the span of the last hundred years, and although they incorporate vastly different technologies, industrial, mechanical, and digital, they share a view of the world made better through technology. From Hibbelsheimer's Concept City of 1927, to Archigram's plug-in city of the 1960s, to MAD's superstar mobile Chinatown of 2010, they are all modernistic and that they are all utopian visions of an optimistic but yet unrealizable future. Arguably, the pinnacle of this positivist utopian technological optimism was Norman Bel Geddes' Futurama exhibit at the 1939 New York World's Fair entitled The World of Tomorrow. The pavilion featured a circular theater that rotated around a model of a city that integrated technology efficiency progress, productivity, and happiness into a decisive image of the future. Um, the narrator described the American city of 1960 planned around, I quote, a highly developed modern traffic system. Now remember this exhibit was sponsored by General Motors. Um, but, uh, and I would say at the interest of time, I'm just gonna really quote rather than show any part of the video of this. but. Because, and I'm going to try to do it with a kind of intonation that they had, um, so bear with me, but I think it's uh, worth understanding. At an ever-accelerating rate of progress, science and research has helped us control many of the risks of agriculture, disease, and insects. We will have sh shorter work hours, a greater world, a better world, where a man has begun to win victory over space. There are new opportunities for employment and better ways of living as we move more and more rapidly forward. <laughs> so the story we hear is that new technologies powered by Tayloristic principles of scientific management and control have allowed us to improve our lives and protect ourselves from the vast uncertainties of the human condition. And in this fairy tale, one expects that life would continue to be better and better for many generations. But let's imagine this tale continuing into the 20, early 21st century, where subsequent generations continue to have faith, with good reason, in modernist technologies, in speed, efficiency, and energy, and their potential to make their lives better and better. They drove flying cars, used conveyor belt sidewalks, and fancy appliances, had a live-in robot made, while living in ultra-high-rise towers in a world where the ground is never seen. And if we continue on to today, the story would go that one day the people realized that things were a bit more complicated than they had been led to believe because the fundamental conditions upon which their society, their economy, and their environment relied upon had been quietly but rapidly, rapidly degrading and their resources rapidly depleting. The cruel irony of the widespread and accelerating crisis is the result of the very practices and tools that the people thought were improving their lives over the years. George Jetson might say, Jane, stop this crazy thing. But Walter Benjamin referred to it as the storm of progress in which the angel of history is caught. Historically, technology has been employed as a means to solve problems. But more often than not, it has simply caused other problems. City walls were built to protect citizens from invasions, but as cities grew, they created overcrowding, sewage systems, designed to alleviate disease in cities, cause pollution in our waterways, and put drinking water at risk. Highways alleviate traffic, but spawn more suburban growth that necessitates yet more highways. And architecture's relationship to technology over the past century has been fraught with these same issues. Pro promises of efficiency and pro productivity, a utopian belief in, in better life in the future, but also a tendency to privilege the aesthetic of technology over its implementation. In just a few pages of Vers in Architecture, Le Corbusier manages to firmly tie technology to the image of the machine, and subsequently the machine with efficiency through Taylorism and Fordism. Yet the ultimate machine habite, the house at Garsh, 
was constructed through conventional masonry techniques rather than reinforced concrete. It is the image of technology, and the prevalence of the image of technology continued throughout the 20th century, be it structural, mechanical, digital, or environmental, where the image of the machine is clad with the image of green. But this legislated, codified, privatized for profit lead sustainability still relies on extant building protocols, materials, and aesthetic that we inherited from modernism, in spite of its sustainable materials, solar panels, geothermal heating, etc. I mean, I think it's interesting to note that this has been photographed, the, the image on, I guess, your left is photographed with a, without a single pedestrian, and it still is using the image of the car in motion to sort of create an atmosphere. So what are the future of technology in the face of what is now being called global climate disruption? What can we do? I asked three questions. Can design escape the impulse to represent technology? Can we uncouple technology from the burdens of modernist positivism and notions of efficiency? And can we think of technology instead as a form of ecology? I have become accustomed to the idea, or maybe a little squeamish still, about the idea of biotechnology. This fish was just approved by a governmental panel. Uh, this is a genetically modified salmon um, this week. Um, uh, so we're, we're used to this idea of bi biology and technology coming together and biotechnology. And I ask, is it, is it not too far a stretch to think of technolo technologies ecologically? And I'll propose the word technicology um, as a way to think about this. Um, so how might this affect the way we operate as architects? Four tactics I'd like to uh, propose. First, more dynamic, accessible information technologies. Uh, technologies that use information in conjunction with architecture uh, and to, to produce a feedback loop of useful information. Um, one example is during the 70s oil crisis, the uh, Dutch government built two housing developments, one which had the uh, meters, electric meters in the basement, another that had uh, the electric meters in the entryway. When the government asked everybody to conserve, the um, people in the, uh, whose meters were in the entryway consistently were able to conserve like 35% more than the people who had their meters in the basement. I mean, it's a simple correlation of awareness. Um, and in this example here, um, uh, the website bikegrid.com, it's a bicycle rental station viewer in London. And this is the little, I don't know if it, uh, can you just mouse over it and click on it? Yeah, there. Um, oh boy, it's not very readable, is it? Um, so you can view it as a map or a grid of availability graphs. It's real-time feedback information that constantly lets you know the availability of bicycles in, in your area. Um, another uh, example might be uh, the Living Light Canopy by The Living. Uh, it's a canopy in Peace Park in Seoul uh, where real-time information about air quality is constantly projected, but as well also public interest in that air quality. Um, Second, technologies that are hybrid, redundant, and messy. Um, this is a project by Port, who are the WPA2 competition winners, um, that takes CO2 from vehicular tunnels, captures it for an algae farm that produces biofuel. Stores, the storage vessels are huge, so they're a kind of infrastructure in themselves, but then that infrastructure, and then also the farm requires these enormous fields. Um, but that provides an opportunity as an armature for a waterfront park. Um, or the Rising Currents uh, exhi exhibition that's going on at MoMA now. Um, these are entry or the uh, projects by an architect, SCAPE, and LTL. They're all, I would argue, hybrid, redundant, and messy, um, whereas modern technologies tended to segregate use into commercial, industrial, agricultural, residential, and recreational. These integrate program and bring together things back into the city that were once relegated as extra urban. And I think that's an important difference between this and a kind of cross programming, really. Um, third, technologies that are less determinate, oh, it went over, um, I'll click up, uh, and more provisional. Um, the Diller Scafidio Blur Building used technologies to create a dynamic fog that was regulated by real time feedback me mechanisms, constantly out of control. 
Um, uh, Francois Roche's BMU Museum, which uses a kind of grown almost biological skin of an electromagnetic mesh that attracts the dust of the city, um, uh, kind of gives the gritty reality of the urban condition as well. Um, fourth, uh, technologies, and it sort of relates to the last slide as well, uh, the afterlife of buildings. This is a, a visions of the future from the Venice Biennale 2008, uh, the Polish Pavilion. Um, the idea here was to look at sort of adaptive reuse or repurposing of buildings that might no longer be viable in 30 years. For example, on the left is a Norman Foster. These are star architecture buildings too. On the, on the left is a Norman Foster um, real estate uh, uh, office building. What happens when the real estate market crashes? Happens to be a donut plan. It makes a kind of perfect panopticon. Could it become a prison? Or Terminal 2, what happens to Terminal 2 once the price of uh, jet fuel becomes so prohibitive we can't fly like we do anymore? Um, perhaps it becomes, the airstrip becomes converted for agricultural fields and the terminal itself becomes an a, a animal husbandry uh, space. Very quickly, uh, uh, Yusman Haq is gonna talk about this, so I won't really say anything because I'm over. Uh, Sky, this is his Sky Air project, um, uh, the, which uh, looks at the spatial investigation of electromagnetic fields, and its uh, users are able to control these, um, uh, the, there's a kind of floating carbon fiber mesh. Um, Back up one second. These are technologies that are social and public. Um, uh, and people at, using cell phones at the ground level can help control this or move it or guide it collectively, but also it gives them uh, 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 the ability to listen to distant natural electromagnetic, electromagnetic sounds of the sky. Uh, Rafael Lozana Hammer's uh, Underscan. Uh, urban projections of over uh, that, that have been uh, installed in over uh, half a dozen cities, the latest in L London, where shadows are cast and other images of other people are sort of projected into your shadow. Um, yellow arrow uh, using texting technologies, not unlike used in museums, for people to create a kind of uh, personal history of the of their city. Uh, which you can text in and get sort of your tour of the city by finding these tags and, and texting in about them. Um, lastly, Graffiti Research Lab, a low-tech open source technologies that are, uh, they have the information about how to do this on their own website so you can go make your own digital graffiti. Um, uh, they're temporary appropriations of urban faces for political and social means. Um, the taggers of the, um, in China during the Olympics were actually arrested, but because there was actually no damage, uh, they, were, they had to release them. Um, I'll just end by saying that for the future of technology, we have an extraordinary mandate to use design and technologies to help manage an increasingly complex and crowded planet, which we just may be able to do so if we can relieve ourselves of the historical burden of projecting the future perfect. <laughs>